Hello friends, welcome to the world of English literature once again. So we have been discussing the adventure by Jain Narlika which is for class 11, chapter 7 from the text Hornbill. My name is Amit and with me is Dr. Asher Jesu Das. Hi Amit, hi everyone. Uh, we have been through three parts of this chapter already. In the first one we did the summaries, the second one we discussed themes. The third one we did questions pertaining to the literary, historical, scientific aspects of the story. In this part, we will concentrate more on the grammatical part, the part related to form, creativity, etc. So let us get going, Asher. Um, sure. So the first one is uh, we want to talk about language, you know. So while we were discussing things about history, science, reality, identity, quantum theory, uh, you know, catastrophe theory and all of that. One very interesting aspect is the play of language, you know, and the most interesting thing that, uh, that is prominently displayed over there is the fact that in the alternate reality, um, usually when we see road signs, we see, uh, especially in Maharashtra, if you go to Maharashtra, uh, you will find that road signs are generally in English and in Marathi, right? So those are the two common signs that you'll see and most of the signs are in Marathi. However, in the alternate reality that Professor Guy Tonde lands in, he finds that road signs are in three languages, English, mm -hmm. Hindustani, which is different from Hindi because it's, it's got a lot of Persian words and, uh, you know, influence of Urdu, like I mean, what, what we call Urdu. So it's the Hindi-Urdu combination, right? And Marathi. So there are, there are all three languages on road signs everywhere they go. So the presence of language, how language is related to power, is, is also demonstrated because, uh, because you know, the fact that the British went away and the Peshwas won that war uh, and yet were uh, let, let the Mughal emperors be uh, a puppet dynasty. Uh, they, they let these three languages thrive at the same time. So tolerance, so tolerance towards languages is, is greater. So based on those situations, we've got a few questions. Hypothetically, sure. we want to put ourselves <clears throat> into the story and we want to imagine what languages were these conversations taking place in? You know, because Professor Guy Tonde talks to the receptionist at times. He's talking to uh, Rajendra at some point. He's talking to Khan Sahib at some point. Uh, so what language are these discussions happening in? That's something that is worth thinking about, right? So the first one, Amit, I will ask you the questions and you can tell us, you know, what language you think they're talking in and why, right? So the first one is, in which language do you think Gangadhar Pant and Khan Sahib talked to each other? Which language did Gangadhar Pant use to talk to the English receptionist? Very interesting question. Now, Gangadhar Pant's um, language is Marathi. He's a professor, so he can also speak English. Khan Sahib is from Peshawar, and they're both from United India, which Gaitonde does not know about. Khan Sahib's language is Urdu. Um, so they are probably speaking to each other in Hindustani which is mutually intelligible because Marathi people would understand a certain kind of Hindi, which would be Hindustani mixed with uh, Hindi mixed with Persian vocabulary, like you pointed out. Right. Um, and Khan Sahib would also be ab e easily be able to understand Hindustani, which was the lingua franca of most of North India. The second part of your question is, which language did Gangadhar Pant use to talk to the English receptionist? Now, the English receptionist being British, knows only English, unless she has also learned a little bit of Hindustani staying in India, which a lot of British people did, by the way. So most probably he's speaking to her, in Eng to English receptionists in English, right. but with a probably smattering of a little Hindustani as well. That, that's interesting that you point out that the receptionist might have learned Hindi because we see that the that the Indian part of the country is more developed than the pre the the little uh, region, Mumbai, that the British have. So the power equations have changed. So Brit the British are no longer colonizers, but they are just at an equal footing. And India seems to be more developed. So the chances are that they probably learnt our language. But still, it would be a combination of English, maybe a little bit of Hindustani. And uh, it's interesting that you point out that it will be Hindustani between Khan Sahib and, uh, and Professor Guy Tonde. Uh, it reminds me of my childhood days when I grew up in Maharashtra. And, and it's interesting to point out that even the Hindi they speak there is very different, you know. Little things like when you say, hum ja rahe hain, over there it just say, they say, hum ja rahe. You know, so it'll be interesting, like, yeah. you, you know, when you, when, you, when you try and 
put these dialogues into the into the uh, characters' heads, it makes it so much more imaginative and creative. And uh, if you're that kind of a person, then try and imagine these dialogues in different types of Hindi and languages, right? Hyderabadi Hindi. Hyderabadi Hindi, Aurangabadi Hindi. Or with uh, different kinds of inflections that people Mumbai use. Hindi. You know. Also, another point that you mentioned is the language of power. It'd be very interesting to know that English um, is not really that sophisticated a language in terms of its historical growth. The British always try to speak French, which is why English has such a smattering of phrases like rake in sans or ta 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 or rendezvous. All these are French words. So the British were always fascinated by French and Italian literature, even till date. And um, so the British literature of the 19th and 20th century, century is hugely influenced by French and Italian uh, literature. So it's um, a matter of wonder how the entire world kind of speaks English because that is the language of power because the United States is, is a superpower and gradually British colonies started speaking English and so English though as a language is not very developed, it's becoming like a global language. Right. So it's got to do with power rather than an intrinsic worth of the language itself. Right, right, and that's an interesting point. And uh, just to add on to that, uh, English is a language that adapts from different languages and adopts from different languages, right? So it's taken so many Indian words, despite being a language of power. Imagine how many in more Indian words would have been a part of English vocabulary had it not been a language of power. If if India had risen in power comparison to, in comparison to the British. I think a lot of English vocabulary would have been Hindi words. I'll right? give a couple of very interesting examples. One word is Jagannath, which is directly from Jagannath because the British could not spell, uh, pronounce Jagannath. So it became Jagannath. So Jagannath is a word which anything that is very heavy, difficult to move, like government files, bureaucracy, any task that is difficult to accomplish is Jagannath. Right. Shampoo comes from Champi. Shampoo. Champu, tail malish. Right. So, uh, and then gradually the word changed its meaning to what is um, now shampoo. Mm. Or tank, which comes from Marathi actually, tanka, which is from Sanskrit tanka to uh, tanka in Marathi. To um, the Portuguese took it back to Europe, to English tank, back to Hindi as tanki. So the ta became a ta through that. Um, anyway, let's move there's, on. There's the also question. catamaran, which comes from the Tamil word katamaram. You know, right, uh, very interesting. Mulagatani soup. From right. But anyway, there are so many examples like this. Uh, and even even newer ones, you know, these, these are like uh, proper English words now. But even now, the latest uh, word, I believe, that's been included in the Oxford Dictionary is areva. So, so they're, they're taking these words and, yeah. you know, so... So in, in, interesting, but the next one, in which language do you think Bau Saibanchi Bakar was written? In Marathi. Yeah, it's clearly Marathi. It has to be Marathi because even the title is in Marathi. Yeah. Okay, there is mention of three communities in the story, the Marathas, the Mughals and the Anglo-Indians. Right. Which language do you think they used within their communities and while speaking to the other groups? Right. So the Marathas would speak within their community in Marathi, but with other groups, they would probably use Hindustani mm -hmm. or Urdu, mm -hmm. uh, depending on where you were. Mm -hmm. Also English, if they were interacting with the English. Okay. The um, educated ones probably. Mughals used Persian in their court. And um, it'd be very interesting to learn, Asha, that the lower courts, until even after the British had come, were used, still using Persian. Okay. Um, and like now the business is conducted in English, but it's heavily Latinized English, which uses a lot of Latin words. And similarly, a lot of Persian words were used in Urdu vocabulary. So it's, the court always keeps its language very difficult and inaccessible to people. It's always been like that. Um, the Anglo-Indians would have spoken within themselves in English. But like I said, they had to learn Hindustani to interact with uh, Indians. Like my work is on John Lang in PhD. He knew Persian and Hindustani very well because as a lawyer he had to fight in the courts and interact with people, take their cases. So there's a lot of confluence of all these. He was the lawyer of uh, the, Rani. the Rani of Jhansi. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of confluence and traditionally in India everybody has been multilingual. Everybody knows three or four languages easily and you can see that uh, despite whatever denominations, affiliations they're coming from, everybody in India has had to adapt to a three or four language formula to make it easy for themselves. Right. And that brings us to the next uh, question which we've already touched upon. Uh, and we've often realized that English is more than a language for a lot of Indians, you know, like if, if I don't know how to speak Tamil, I don't feel embarrassed about it. Or if I don't know how to speak Hindi or Bengali for that matter, I don't feel embarrassed about it. But English somehow, um, not, not, just, it, not in a justified manner, it should not be. But for a lot of people, it becomes a matter of self-esteem, mm -hmm. right? So that brings me to the next question. Do you think the ruled, the people who are ruled, always adapt or adopt the language of the ruler? Is it always like that? And what are the consequences of this? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And like you rightly pointed out, this is a huge issue in India that there's a complex about learning English. Like many parents take pride that their uh, children do not know Hindi or whatever uh, native language they speak. The, the child goes to uh, elite school and learns only English. And that's a huge problem because one needs to know one's roots very well where we are coming from. And this becomes a cause of anxiety later on in one's life. And this is a strength, actually, that each of us in India know at least three languages. Absolutely. Um, and as a linguist, I can affirm this, that in Europe and uh, in, in the West, where people primarily speak only one language, they're really fascinated by countries like India, where everyone... Over there, it's a matter of accomplishment if someone learns a second language. If someone speaks three languages, the person is considered to be a genius, which means every Indian is basically a genius for them because every Indian speaks at least three languages. And still we live in the complex that we don't know English. Right. And uh, we well. should have the pride that we speak so many languages and English is just another language. And so coming to this question, um, the ruled always impose their language, impose their culture. So there's Macaulay's Minutes in the 1830s where he says that all the books of India put together are equal to one shelf of uh, books in Britain. So that's of course a very foolish, arrogant statement that Lord Macaulay made. But people took it kind of seriously and started learning English and the jobs were available for English speakers, which is why people from Bengal got the jobs uh, first, the Anglo-Indians got the jobs first. And gradually this complex, this uprooting of um, culture happened. And so this complex is a colonial complex, which we have been suffering for 200 years. And it's not just about British colonies. The French colonies, which is Northern Africa, has to learn French. The Spanish colonies in Latin America have had to learn Spanish. So the colonizer always um, controls their territory by imposing their uh, language as well. And that's been the history. So unfortunately, um, that cannot go away, the history of the world. But we need to understand, be self-aware that other languages, our own languages, are equally important. All right, and I'd just like to add that it's not only about English, right? When you talk about the language of power, uh, any language which is in power across the world will generally tend to do similar things to other languages that are not in power. And it brings a very interesting quote to me, which wherein they say that a, a, di a dialect or a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Right? Mm -hmm. So the difference between a dialect and a, and a language, like what um, uh, variety of lang uh, dialect actually becomes a language is basically how much power you have. And uh, even now in, in, in today's world, we see that a lot of tribal languages are, are kind of getting pushed back uh, and a lot of speakers are not getting to express themselves. They're not getting opportunities to, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, write literature in their language because of other dominant languages within the country. Uh, no matter what language it is, North Indian, South Indian, you know. So these kind of power politics of language will always be there. And it's not just English, uh, you know. So any language in power essentially will dominate other languages and eventually push them back. So as a linguist, it's very interesting for me because a lot of linguists are doing a lot of great work in preserving languages. Okay, so um, let's move on from language now, uh, from the discussion on different kinds of language to the specifics of English. We have some questions. I think I'll throw these questions at you and you can no. uh, give us the answers. Um, we need to identify synonyms, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a phrase and you tell me what it means, okay? Sure. I'll give you some options. So the first one is uh, to take issue with, like I take issue with something. 
What does that mean? Does it mean to accept, to discuss, to disagree or to add? Uh, it is to disagree. So, I take issue with what you are saying means that I have a disagreement and I want to give a different point of view. Okay, wonderful. To give vent to. Options are to express, to emphasize, to suppress or to dismiss. To give vent to is a form of expression. I gave vent to my feelings. I gave vent to my anger. So I expressed my anger. By punching the wall. Something like that. Yeah, okay, all right. So to, to express, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. To stand on one's feet, to be physically strong, to be independent, to stand erect or to be successful? To be independent. Okay, could you give us an example of it? Um, well, Virginia Woolf was a great feminist writer of the early 20th century where she, in her book, A Room of One's Own, says um, that a woman should have a room of one's own to be able to be an independent thinker, independent writer and so on and so forth. So I must remind you, Asha, that in the early part of 20th century, women did not have voting rights in most parts of the world. Right. And we were really fortunate in India to get voting rights for both genders simultaneously at 1947. So we were very blessed. It's been a very long struggle of 200 years for women to be able to stand on their feet through constitutional rights. All right, very good. That's a great example. To be wound up, to become active, to stop operating, to be transformed or to be destroyed? I think the answer to this is to stop operating. That's, that's close. To be wound up means to be wound up like, let's say, a woolen, a woolen bowl gone wrong and then you get wound up, you do not find the uh, edges of it. Um, it it kind so of reminds me of a clock though, you know those earlier times you get, you used to have those clocks and you wind them up yeah. and then, then there's like tension, that tension yeah. in the spring keeps the clock going tick, yeah. tick, tick, so tick, you, so you're, you're kind of like there's a lot of tension inside you and you're kind of wound up, that's, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the meaning that so I so get from it. So you stop operating for a little while. Okay, alright. Yeah. Okay. To meet one's match, Okay. to okay. meet a partner who has similar tastes. Mm -hmm. To meet an opponent, to meet someone who is equally able as yourself, or to meet defeat? To meet someone who is equally able as oneself. Okay. Could you use that in a sentence <clears throat> for us? Um, Novak Djokovic found his match in Rafael Nadal in the French Open of 2020. Okay, okay. All right, wonderful. So the next set we have is distinguishing between the following pairs of sentences. The okay. first one, he was visibly moved as opposed to he was visually impaired. Okay, so visibly versus visually. Okay, so, so visibly essentially means something that you can see. For example, um, so if, if you say, let's just take these examples, he was visibly moved, moved as in touched or disturbed in a, in a diff in emotionally, you know. So you could see. So anything that you can a see A change is of expression on somebody's face right. which you visibly can see. Right. Anything that you can see is visible and that's where visibly com comes in. But visually is the ability to see, right? So visually impaired, I, I, the person who, who cannot see itself. So the, so the ability to see is visual, but uh, what you see, the object that you see is visible. So okay. that would be the difference. The next one. Green and black stripes were used alternately. Green stripes could be used or alternatively black ones. Okay, so al alternately would be uh, one after the other, right? So if we had uh, three Amit Ranjans and three Ashers and we put Asher, Amit Ranjan, then, then Asher, then Amit Ranjan. We, we, see we have Ashers and Amit Ranjans. Let's make it simpler. A, ze <laughs> a, a zebra crossing okay. is alternate black All and that. white yes so yeah. black and white so black and white are uh, present alternately right yeah. uh, alternative on the other hand is is instead of right alternatively so instead of amit ranjan we could have someone else or so instead of asher we can have alternatively we can have xyz person so in this example either green stripes could be used or black ones could be used not both like zebra crossings the third one the team played two matches successfully the team played two matches Successively. Okay. So successful is when you win, when you when you're successful at something, when you achieve success. Successive is one after the other. Okay. So you play one match and then you 
the next day you play another match and the next day you play another match so you played three days in succession so that is successive successive right okay. and if you won all three matches then you were successful in all three matches i successfully won all the three matches so i successfully won all three successive matches right right wonderful okay. the next one the librarian spoke respectfully to the learned scholar you will find the historian and the scientist in the archaeology and natural science sections of the museum respectively right so respectfully is when you have a lot of respect when you when you have that kind of a uh, you know when you when you see someone senior or someone respected you give them respect okay. right respectively is is kind of used like to each his own for example if you say amit and asha uh, put on their respective mics which means you put on your mic and i've put on my mic okay so respective to each is his own okay right so the next um, header we have is noticing form a form is very important there are two parts to any narrative any story one is the form and one is the content and both content and form are interwoven one does not work without the other but form means the structure how this sentence is structured so you can imagine structures as buildings as roads that a city has to be structured in a certain way but at the same time it's the people who make the city and so both are important so we'll here do one aspect of noticing what kind of sentences have been used because it's a speculative fiction there would be a lot of speculation hypothesizing um, wondering what would have happened if that would have happened and so this story deals with a lot of those so i'll throw some of these sentences at you asher and you explain what these are about okay so the question um, in the book is the story deals with unreal and hypothetical conditions Mm -hmm. some of the sentences used to express this notion are given below mm -hmm. the first one if i fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed i know where it will be at a later time right so all of these questions actually this entire set has to do with conditionals which is a topic in grammar okay um so i think i'll i'll just introduce conditionals a little bit just talk about conditional so conditionals are when you have different conditions like you it, they're always in the form of if and then statements uh so there are different kinds of if and then statements that can arise um so there are there are four types of conditionals uh, there's the first conditional second conditional and third conditional which have all been mentioned here but there's also something called a zero conditional so the zero conditional is uh something which is essentially a fact which is always true so let me give you an example of that first Okay. and then i will distinguish that with this right okay um so it, it could be a statement like if you boil water it evaporates right so i don't say if you boil water it will evaporate or if you will boil water it will evaporate yeah so that is grammatically wrong you know yeah. a lot of people say if you will mm -hmm. uh that is a grammatical that is considered to be a, an error in standard grammar because mm -hmm. with if you don't add will right mm -hmm. it's always the will is always added if necessary okay uh after the then right So if you boil water so the the options are either you say it will evaporate or you say it evaporates both are right but you would choose it evaporates because it's always true it's a universal it's truth it's a universal truth so that's right. your zero conditional which okay. is a fact which never changes right mm -hmm. as opposed to that you've got the first conditional which is explained here so in this case if you fire a bullet from a gun with all that extra information it will fly or it will be somewhere at a particular time if you fire it will be right so it's not a universal truth but you're making a fair prediction which means that it's a realistic prediction it's not a universal truth it's not always true mm -hmm. but you can you it's a realistic situation so the first conditional is used in a realistic situation which means that you ask yourself is it possible for me to fire a gun yes is it possible for a bullet to fly uh, in a certain direction yes so it's a realistic situation in which you use this kind of a construction where you say if you fire a bullet so you use the present tense okay if you fire you don't say if you fired you say you fire a bullet from a gun then it it uh i know where it will be so you don't use would or could but you use will you use the future tense right so that's your first conditional right so if i fire a bullet from a gun in a given direction at a given speed i know 
where it will be at a later, later, later time. Okay, yeah? so this involves something which is a fair prediction. It's a fair prediction. The probability of something like this happening is it's real. There. Is there. Okay, let's get to the second one. Okay. If I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Right. Now, if you notice, he's not saying, if I know the answer. Mm -hmm. He's yes. saying, if I knew. Now, mm -hmm. that's the second conditional coming mm -hmm. in, right? Okay. Which basically means that the probability of someone knowing this doesn't exist. It's not very high, which mm. means it's, a, it's an unrealistic situation. Mm. Okay, mm. Um, So, which means that this answer cannot be known. And in this text, they're talking about uh, Professor Gaitonde moving from one reality to another reality. Professor Gaitonde asks Rajendran, why did I go? And Rajendra says, if I knew, because he doesn't, there's no way he can know what another person was thinking or why something like that happened. Right? So it's an unrealistic situation, an unreal situation. In this case, you use the past tense. You don't say, if I know, but if you say, you say I, if I knew. And then again, the second part becomes, instead of will, you say would, and instead of can, you say could. And you can see these in the slides uh, that, are, that are mentioning these points and these examples. Uh, so if I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Right. So, unrealistic, that's why you're using the past tense and would. Right. And this also applies to bigger questions of life, of right. history. Right. Say, if I ask you, who was the first man on earth? And you would say, if I knew the answer, I would solve a great problem. Yeah. I could say that. Or, yeah, yeah, you can mm. use it for several, several situations like that. And you can also use it in different situations, like many magical, unrealistic situations. Like, if I knew magic... So I, I wouldn't say if I know magic, I would say if I knew magic, I would build a palace for myself. If I knew magic, I would defeat Harry Potter. If I knew magic, I would defeat Harry Potter. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The next one. If he himself were dead in this world, what guarantee had he that his son would be alive? Right. Again, a similar conditional. We're talking about an unrealistic situation because obviously he's alive. So you cannot be alive and dead at the same time. So the possibility of both of these things happening in the same reality doesn't exist. So unreal conditional. So you're using the past tense. He himself were dead. Now it is important to notice that with the to be verb, you don't say was. You don't say was for unreal conditions. You say were. Mm -hmm. So if I were dead in this world, uh, you know, if I were the president of this country or if I were a woman, uh, you know, so when, I mean, I cannot be a man and a woman at the same time, right? So it's a, it's an unrealistic situation. So you say, if I were, you don't say, if I was. Um, so if I were dead in this world, or if he himself were dead in this world, what guarantee had he that his son would be alive? So again, the same kind of structure. So getting back to the story, this strange statement is because Professor Guy Tonde shifted to alternate reality was not sure whether this was after life or life, whether he was alive or whether he was dead. And which is why he says, if he himself were dead in the world. Right. All right. The last one in this set. What course would history have taken if the battle had gone the other way? All right. Now, this is interesting. This is the third conditional. And this refers to past events. So all of the others, we're talking about the future. We're making predictions about the future. Right. One is uh, a prediction, which is a science, which is a universal truth. So I can predict with 100% certainty. Mm -hmm. The second one, uh, the first conditional is where there is a probability, a great probability of something happening. So I can use will because it's a definite probability. The third one is where I use would with, a, with the past tense because it's an improbable situation. But they're all predicting, projecting things onto the future. But this third conditional actually goes back into the past. So we're talking about something. So what course would history have taken, right? So what would it, what would have happened, right? Uh, if the battle had gone the other way. So we are using two past perfect constructions and we're talking about a past hypothetical event. So something in the past which did not happen, but what if it had happened? So here we would use would, would. Yeah, we would use would, would, and would have happened, right? right. right? Uh, so, for example, if Sachin had scored one more run, he would have had his 100th century. Right. So that's been very useful, talking about the conditionals, and I hope you understood uh, this section. 
So now it is time to wrap up um, this lesson with um, this fourth part. And as you have seen, it is a very interesting um, um, short story by Jayant Narlikar and it is a confluence of many, many ideas. It is a scientist who is a writer, who is writing about a history professor, is writing about history going a different way, writing about alternate reality. So I am sure this has excited you um, a lot and it is food for thought in various directions, which is why we have had to spend four um, um, sessions on it. And linguistically also it is very interesting as we have seen with uh, different kinds of idioms and sen sentence constructions and so on and so forth. And hopefully this will also arouse your um, interest in science fiction, not just science fiction, but in general in science and history and the ideas of pursuit of truth through different disciplines that all knowledge is knowledge. So yeah, I mean it is uh, it's interesting because you know it is an overlap of history. Overlap, overlap of little elements of philosophy, there are linguistic aspects, there are historical aspects and I think students can get interested in all of these things, you know. So, students can decide what aspect of the story, so if you, if you like the historical aspect, then pursue history a little more diligently. If you, if you like the scientific aspect, maybe you are meant to be a scientist. If you like the linguistic aspect, maybe you can take up linguistics for further studies. So, in terms of career choices, this lesson again gives you like a diverse variety of fields and then you know, gives you a perspective because different people will like different sections of, of this text. So, uh, so feel free to enjoy it in your own way. We've, we've tried to give you as many different perspectives as we could. Uh, like of course, the elephant and the blind man. Like the elephant and the blind man, right? So all of us uh, from our own vantage points, everyone has got their own perspectives. So uh, give it your reading. Maybe you'll have, you'll, you'll interpret it in ways that we haven't covered. So, so feel free to to interpret it, uh, you know, watch all our videos, uh, send us your questions and we'll be happy to answer them for you as well. Um, so, so. Um, thanks a lot Ashit and thanks a lot um, friends for participating in this yes. and hope to see you with another short story very soon. Thank, Thank you. you.